Hi, Ellen. Hey. Get the road on the show. We are recording in progress. Oh, Ellen's here too. There's our 12. Yeah. We're all filled out. Three by four. It feels OCB safe. Thank you. <laughs> hey, Dave, I have a question for you. Sure thing. Okay. I hear you talk a lot that there's a difference between Thomas Merton contemplative and Brother Lawrence presence. And I'm having a hard time separating the two because I thought that to be in the presence, you needed to be contemplative. Where well, have you heard me say that there's a difference? Uh, in the way of the heart, you were talking about how you had been a lot with the Brother Lawrence thinking and that you were getting back into the contemplative meditation. Oh, okay. Yeah, that doesn't really have anything so much to do with Merton. Uh, what I was saying was that when I first started, I was um, very, very um, disciplined that every morning I had a centering prayer sit. You know, I had I had a routine, got up at five and I had this routine and it included a centering prayer sit. Um, in more recent years, I said that I've gone more to the Brother Lord's school so instead of designating a specific time for a center of prayer sit, I was trying to remain present and connected and aware throughout the day. If you recall, Brother Lord said that he quit all forms of, of uh, devotion, except the ones that he was obligated to do by the rule of his house. And so all the other ones he let go because he didn't need them anymore. And he basically was, he was like one of those desert critters that gets all the water they need from the food they eat. He was kind of like that, you know. He was able to just get what he needed just throughout the day and had a seamless connection. So he was letting go of some of the, the more ritual practices. So over the years, I, I've gravitated more to that. But there are times when um, the water gets rough enough that I got to go back and start doing those six again. And so I'm starting to get off the beam. But it really, it wasn't a Thomas Merton versus Brother Lawrence thing. Uh, and, you know, what what Brother Lawrence is doing is practicing a contemplative life and contemplative prayer. It's all the same. It's just a question of how it's structured. I didn't think, I really didn't think there was, um, maybe I didn't, you answered the question, but it wasn't like it was either or, but it was like, you were using one for one purpose and one for another. That's, and I wanted to make sure if I had understood that correctly, even though you were after for the same peace and serenity that brother Lawrence, because from what I understand it with contemplative prayer, it would be like James Finley teach, be still and know that I am God. And you pause, you go be still and know that I am. And you pause and you go be still and know and you put a pause between those and then you get B and then it's complete silence. So I thought, well, maybe there's no ritual of re repeating a scripture that it's more just B. Yeah, I suppose you could say it that way. You know, um, Brother Lawrence isn't big on ritual and, 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 uh, and set devotional practice. He's just about experience. He's kind of like John Gibson, you know, just love. I don't, don't, don't bother me with theology. I just want love. You know, that would be John. And Brother Lawrence is kind of like that, you know, he says, well, yeah, I mean, his, his quotes are always, he said, you know, people think that we got to invent all of these extravagant ways of coming at God. And he said, it's just not so. Just do what you normally do all day long, but do it for the sake of God, do it for the love of God. You know, do it with God in mind and in, in presence, and it becomes a sacred act. So Brother Lawrence is all about just living life with a constant stream of presence rather than specific rituals, practices, or techniques. And it's not that, that one is bad and one is good, but all the techniques that we use and all the centering prayer um, carved out sits that we do should be geared for becoming Brother Lawrence. I mean, the, the, the whole purpose is not that we can sit for 20 or 30 minutes in silence uh, in our prayer closet, but that we learn how to do that well enough that we can then do it all day long. And when we get triggered and when we get pulled off and when our mind wanders, 
we have those techniques really down in muscle memory that we can just automatically come back to and bring ourselves back to center. So think of it as a musician in her um, practice room playing scales all day long. Not so she can play scales all day long in her practice room, it's so that those scales will be under her fingertips when she's on stage and the lights are on and the audience is there and the smoke machine is going and the strobes and all that. And none of that distracts her. She can still play and play the music without thinking about it, which means she's really present to it and emoting through it, which is a completely different being than having to still work through the mechanics. So that's what we're doing in, in, in centering prayer and associated techniques. We're working through the mechanics, getting it down into muscle memory so that it's automatic for us seamlessly throughout our day. Yeah. And not to get too far ahead, um, and, and I, I'm not going to, I'm just going to acknowledge that um, on page 82, um, he acknowledges just what you said. Cool. Reinforcements are on the way. So... Does, does that help, Lori? Does that yeah, thank you for that. Okay, great, great. Because yeah. part of my problem is, is that like in, Oct in October, I missed so much because I was out of town for business. So sometimes it's hard to jump back in and jump back and forth. So thank yeah. you. Cool. Okay, let's go to page 81. This is the 16th and final letter of, uh, of the book. Now, I want you to notice, go forward like John Hartman did. To page 82 and notice the date February 6th, 1691. Anybody recall Brother Lawrence's death date? Six days later. Yep. yep. February 12th, mm. 1691. So he wrote this letter six days before he died. Yep. And it's just a matter of keeping that in mind as you read these words. So remember his last year was a tough one because he got three illnesses back to back and what actually killed him was pleurisy which is very painful well, i do i've never had it but um so he's in a lot of pain he's coming to the end he's pretty sure he knows he's coming to the end he kind of resented when the doctors healed him the first two times you know because uh, he said that they delayed him going to his god but um so just keep that in mind. It, it does make a difference. He says, my good mother. And so this is the same um, Reverend Mother that he's been writing to for the last three letters or so. God knows best what we need, and everything he does is for our good. If we knew how much he loves us, we would always be ready to receive from him with equanimity, the sweet and the bitter, even the most painful and the most difficult trials would be pleasing and agreeable. Such afflictions ordinarily are unbearable only when viewed in the wrong way. And when we believe that it is the hand of God acting on us, that it is a father filled with love who subjects us to this humiliation, grief, and suffering, then all the bitterness of these tribulations is forgotten and we rejoice in them. Okay, so there's Brother Lawrence at his perverse best, right? His Catholic best, medieval Catholic best. <clears throat> um, you know, by this time in, in reading Brother Lawrence, does this stuff just kind of roll off of you, or does it still have any kind of uh, reaction from you all? I can do some more. <clears throat> okay. I, I could. I was just, I was just wondering if, uh, if this still created a reaction. Earlier on in the book, you know, some of you were visibly twitching and you know, shifting in your seats when uh, we read some of the stuff. Um, God knows best what we need and everything he does for our good. Um, you know, he loves us. We would always be ready to receive from him with equanimity, the sweet and the bitter, even the most painful, most difficult trials would be pleasing and agreeable. He's kind of channeling that all things work together. together. Um, for good, for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So Romans 8, Paul, you know, there's that that flavor, that theme is coming through. You know, God knows best what we need, and everything he does is for our good. 
-hmm. even if it hurts like heck right now, right? Mm -hmm. That's the basic idea here. So even if you're going through it, even if it's horrible, if you know that it's coming from God, the only thing that comes from God is goodness. Therefore, mm -hmm. right? Kind of like it's all going to be okay in the end. If it's not okay, it's not the end. That sort of idea that um, just you just got to wait it out. It's going to be okay. And once we know that it's God's hand, then it changes everything in terms of our experience and our, our attitude. The worst afflictions ordinarily are unbearable only when viewed in the wrong way. And when we believe that it is the hand of God acting on us, that it is a father filled with love who subjects us to this humiliation, grief, and suffering when all the bitterness of these tribulations is forgotten. And we can rejoice. Um, this idea of the worst afflictions ordinarily are unbearable only when viewed in the wrong way, you know, do you recall what he considers the wrong way? Just not coming from God? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he, there's a couple of letters back that he spent some time on this idea. Um, you know, it was uh, people who are viewing life purely from a material point of view, from a physical point of view, you know, where the highest good is uh, health and wealth and wellness and you know, kind of mm -hmm. like our society, right? And, mm -hmm. and so anything that interrupts that is automatically evil. It's something to be avoided. It's something to be prayed away. Mm -hmm. But to, to Brother Lawrence, you know, it's the, the pain, the suffering is also what connects us on a deeper level. And so, it, and for him, you know, whether it's good or bad in terms of our perception of it, if it's coming from God, and basically everything comes from God, then it has to be okay. And it will mm -hmm. be okay. Anyway. Well, it goes back to that same topic we've had many discussions on of who's, is God pulling the puppet strings when things bad happen to us? So here we go again. So, you know, is he saying that or is he saying, well, it may feel bad or painful, but what does that mean? Are we supposed to just look at it in a positive way and say it's going to be okay or it's going to be for the betterment somehow of us? <laughs> Who's pulling the strings? Are we doing this or is God doing that? And that's really up to you all. I mean, mm -hmm. there, there's nothing in the book. Excellent. One way or another, you get, you get to pick the poison. <laughs> just, just know that whatever one you pick is going to answer certain questions and it's going to beg others. You know, it's always going to be a mixed bag. And so whatever you, whatever you want to call it a worldview, whatever paradigm you choose, about how God actually interacts with us. Is he the master puppeteer? Is he actually filled with love, but subjecting us to this humiliation, all the trials and tribulations and illnesses of life for a reason? Um, or is there some other way that he interacts with us so that he's not directly involved in giving us these problems in life? Um, that's up to you to decide. If whatever you choose allows you still to be able to accept life on life's term without resentment, without anger, without trying to wish it or pray it away, and can live with a sense of hope, gratitude, then you're doing all right. At least for the time being, your worldview is adequate. Just remember you're only one trauma away from having to redo the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So we realize that our our framework, you know, our assumptions, preconceptions, our worldview, you know, they're just mental constructs. And we can choose them. And then at some point, life is probably going to unchoose them for us. Whenever you've had a significant death or loss of anything, it changes your ability to make meaning out of that. Oh. What grief is all about is the journey through remaking meaning and accommodating that loss in our lives. You know, I mean, this, this, I find oh, the, uh, his use of the word humiliation is very interesting. Uh, when he says uh, that it is a father filled with love who subjects us to this humiliation. And I, I, I think it's, uh, it, it's not a word that we would use in today's language. I don't know how, how you feel about that, but I, um, 
and humiliation, grief, and suffering uh, that he talks about, and uh, the bitterness of these tribulations that he says is forgotten, and we rejoice in it. Hmm. Well, you know what? It is pretty humiliating to be sick, especially if someone has to change your bedpan, give you a sponge back. I mean, that's, uh, that's kind of humiliating. So, you know, the loss of your independence, the loss of your ability to care for yourself. Um, so it's actually a pretty good word. Whether God gives it to us or not, you know, that's where I might part ways with, uh, with Brother Lawrence. I don't see it that way, but that's my construct, right? And it's interesting because when, when I say that I don't think that God is the master puppeteer in, organ, in organizing and, and creating every little moment of our lives, you know, for somebody else, that makes God seem so remote and uncaring that it just destroys their ability to feel closeness with God. And so that's what I'm saying. You know, I'd have to deal with that because I don't... I, to me, it make, it's easier for me to believe that God is not involved in those things because when they get really bad, like the death of a child or something, you know, I don't, I can't go there. But God did that for some altruistic reason. But then I get, I need to deal with the closeness of it. Now, I've resolved that for myself, and I actually feel closer to God now than I ever did when I thought He was pulling the strings. Um, but this is what I mean by whatever you choose, you're going to have to deal with the, the dark side. Of that voice. But what is truth? It always is. But what is Sorry? truth? Because, you know, um, I can just go from the experience with my husband's death. I had like, tw I'm not lying, I had 12 plates spinning in the air. And I was just like, I was, I was in shock from his death, but I had to deal with these 12 plates. They, they had to be dealt with. And so if I don't, I think, okay, I don't think God caused it, but I'm having a difficult time figuring out of really understanding and knowing how much interaction he has in my personal life. It's not that I'm not finding meaning, but you know, after a while, it's like, okay, God, I have had enough of this crap. I really, I, I'm calling uncle. I am calling uncle, but that doesn't, <laughs> stop anything you know what i mean it's like it just keeps coming it's when it when the opposition comes in the huge crashing wave it's like can't the tide go out can't the tide just take everything with it and just stay out for just 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 a break you know but it doesn't yeah. work like that and, and didn't it eventually ah <laughs> it's 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 been an interesting path yeah, been, but it's not as bad as it was initially. So it is at a different pitch. And and that's what life does. Life is always oscillating. The tide is going in and going out. Um, you know, my thought is more along the lines that God created the, the universe with laws of physics like entropy, right? Things only go from order to disorder. They never go the other way. Your room is never going to get cleaner by itself. You're going to have to clean it. That's the way life works. You know? And so with those things in place, there's never a free lunch. Then you know, just as God said to know uh, to Adam and Eve, you know, by the sweat of your brow, you're going to have to work. This is the way it goes. And so He created it, knowing that each individual life is going to be presented with equal parts pleasure and pain, and we're going to have to navigate our way through it. I'm waiting for that pony. Does anybody have a horse, like a a barn or something? Because there's got to be a pony in there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I know. Okay, I'd like to add some something. I am. Um... On my drive home, I was listening to a podcast with Malcolm Gladwell. Okay. So he was talking about, well, it was our, uh, Robert F. Kennedy. He died in August. Two months before that was Martin Luther King. And he, he talked about RFK when Martin Luther King died. Robert F. Ken Robert K Kennedy um, spoke spoke and made a spe speech and and he quoted Aeschylus. He said, this is my favorite poet. And, and so I had to look it up. He says, in our sleep, pain which cannot forget falls drop by drop upon our heart until in our own despair against our will comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. 
And mm -hmm. I think that was so powerful. And he says, my, my own brother died also. So I know what, I, I can feel the pain in the Black community. That's, that's his point. And he says here that justice inclines her scale so that wisdom comes at the price of suffering. That is so painful to have to have wisdom, but we have to suffer first. And there's no way out of this. And then there's another actually song I was listening to. I don't know her. You know, what is the cure for pain? The cure for pain is pain. Hmm. Yeah, you, meaning you just have Not to. Not sure through. exactly what that means, but uh, I'll have to find well, Say it. more. Say huh. more. What do you mean? Well, say more. Well, you know, with Aeschylus, the meaning, the pain we have, that we have to go through. Not that it's God who gives us the pain, but the outcome of that. And it's, I think, actually for us to learn from it or not is wisdom. I felt through my pain, too. I have more compassion for others. Oh, yeah. Certainly wisdom is going to be coming through the suffering. You know, we, we, we've gone over that in the last three books. It's been over and over again. Um, the cure for pain is pain. I'm not sure about yeah. that. Well, I think mm -hmm. because I know some women who were going through what I was going through. Now, she looks happy and she would go out with her girlfriends and we will go drinking. Whereas I did the other way. Whereas I go deep into my pain and I go to my counseling. I go speak with other women. When I talk to her every now and then, every now and then she'll still, you could still feel she's not she hasn't gone through it yet. She hasn't healed yet. And that was like, how old are her girls? Probably about 16 years ago. You, well, I'm not, I, uh, you know, I may be missing the point of that, of that line. You know, I would say the cure for pain is connection, but you have to push through the pain and actually feel it. You get to the connection on the other side, so maybe that's where. That's how I understood it. About. You, you okay. have to go through. Yeah, that's how I understood it. Okay, you well then, then the I get it. That makes that makes sense. Yeah, that. How I understood but it. yeah, the, the the there is um there is a purpose to suffering, if we choose to see it that way. If we look at suffering just as an evil to be avoided, if we resent it, if we're constantly resisting it, then it won't teach us anything. Because the, the meaning isn't intrinsically in the event or in the pain. We make the meaning out of the event or the pain. That's up to us. And two people can go through similar experiences, and one can be transformed by it, and the other becomes embittered. You know, it's, it's in the person, our choice, what we're going to do with that. That's why to have an attitude that is more like Brother Lawrence's, even if we disagree with you know, the specifics of how he expresses it, is going to be the difference in, in our attitude and our experience of life, obviously. I'm not there, I can just tell you. I am <laughs> That's not okay, there. dear. It <laughs> takes a while. Uh, I have takes moments. A village. I have moments, but I'm not there. Well, you know, it's like it's like making a pearl necklace. You just keep stringing pearls on the string and eventually you've got a necklace. So you string those moments onto your onto your necklace, and eventually you'll have them. But well, that's it's what funny it is. you it's say just that. Gathering moments. Because I had a ring made, and I have um, I have clamshells on each side of my stone, and there's a pearl in it. Because um, I'm hoping through all this adversity, I get a string of pearls. No, because... that's not the way it works, dear. You Why not? make the string of pearls. By immersing oh, oh. your moments and gathering them. No one's well, going to give it to you. I, you are going to experience it. I just There's a big it. difference in that. You know? A lot I of know, times but we, I misspoke. I misspoke because. Okay, there, as long as we're on the being here, because there's many people. Marion has a cousin who the, the family joke was sitting and watching the aquarium because he was unemployed and he was hyper Christian. And he would sit on the couch in front of the aquarium and pray for God to give him a job. He wouldn't pick up the phone. He wouldn't go out the door. God was going to give him a job while he sat on the couch and watched the aquarium. <laughs> so it don't work that way. I I think you're misunderstanding what I'm saying. It's symbolic. That's great. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> it's symbolic. I You get to be wrong. It's the first wrong of the night. Okay. I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, All right. Let's press ahead. Yeah. 
we, we have one chance to get through letter, letter 16. Let us <laughs> devote ourselves entirely to knowing God. Oh, classic Brother Moses, right? The more we know him, the more we want to know him. Knowledge is commonly the measure of love. The deeper and wider our knowledge, the greater will be our love. And if our love of God is great, we will love him equally in sorrow and in joy. Okay, how does that strike you? Let me read it one more time. Let us devote ourselves entirely to knowing God. The more we know him, the more we want to know him. Knowledge is commonly the measure of love. Really? The deeper and wider our knowledge, the greater will be our love. And if our love of God is great, we will love him equally in sorrow and in joy. That making sense to you? It's starting to sound heady now instead of like the more you know, then you're going to have better love of God. But mm -hmm. so I don't know. It's, maybe it's just a choice of words. I think uh, there's kind of like an intuitive knowing kind of phenomenon. Maybe that's what he's talking about. Um, that's still a little heady and it still has an element of pure understanding, but it's, you know what I mean? There's, there's another vibration to it. And I think when we're in a, you know, a right mindset, for example, you might hear a truth for the first time and just recognize it. It's just clear. It makes sense. Right. Um, and it's still heady, but, you know, it's not just heady. It's not just a thought. <laughs> right. It's just not <laughs> theoretical all the time. <laughs> I like where you're going with this, William. I think you're going there. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Mm. Um, this is not knowledge about God. Okay. This is not factoids. This is not, not uh, you know, intellectual knowing. This is going to be in the Hebrew sense of yada. Right? Yoda, that was the word for hand. Uh, at least the yod is the word for hand. And so yada in, in Hebrew, to know means to have intimate experience with, is what it's talking about. You know, the way a, a craftsman knows his or her tools, the way the musician knows his or her instrument, the way the lover knows the beloved's face. It's, it's that kind of knowing. And it has to do with long hours spent together. It doesn't mean that you can recite a treatise on theological truths about God. It's not that kind of knowing. And so it's so really it's important not, for us to know that. I'm sorry? It's not, it's not the kind of knowing you're saying. It's not like, oh, it's an aha, or it's an I get it. It's not that kind of knowing. It's more the, you just, you, when you know a person's face, like you said, it's that kind of knowing. It's different from the aha moment or the breakthrough. There can moment. be the aha eureka moments along the way, but if we're just relying on those, it's not going to be the same thing as getting up daily and, and doing the do, you know? What what we all have done for all the decades of work in our lives, you know, that is knowing our jobs, knowing the routine, knowing what it feels like. That's the kind of knowing we're talking about. And it, it's it's so in tune with Brother Lawrence. He's all about practicing presence every day, coming to God, being present to God, banishing thoughts that will distract us from God. That's the kind of knowing he's talking about. Now, if you insert that back into the text, notice how it changes everything. Let us devote ourselves entirely to knowing God through this continual and long-standing intimate experience. The more we know him, have this experience of him, the more we want to continue to have that experience. Knowledge commonly, knowledge is commonly the measure of love. But again, that even makes it worse when you say knowledge, right? It's not that like wisdom. That sounds What's wisdom that? to me. Like wisdom. wisdom that might have been a better way to put it. Is the measure of love. The deeper and wider our knowledge, our knowing of God, our experience of God, the greater will be our love. And if our love of God is great, we will love him equally in sorrow and in joy. So he's saying the more that we become intimately familiar and experienced with God, the more the difference between the moments of pleasure and joy start to blur out. We don't have that same dualistic kind of oppositional quality to them. 
and realize that God is just as present in the difficult moments as he is in the and that Brother Lawrence was so close to death and he still focused on the Lord and the pain. What I love about it is that the pain, like you said, it kind of blurred out. Like when you're going through a hard loss. I mean, I've been through many losses and I was so close to the Lord and he smoothed the edges off your character and he shows me that he's enough for me, even though, you know, I have a horrific loss. He he kept telling me, am I enough for you, Carol? And it was like an epiphany because, you know, he took someone that I dearly loved and I almost worshipped. And God goes, no, I'm the reason you're here. You know, you cry every night, but I'm greater than your pain. And so much what Ellen was saying, how some women, when they have a loss, they go to the bars and they go drinking. And I totally identify with you, Ellen. When you went to Bible study, you went to the word of God. And to me, the pain was so worth it. Because I wouldn't be the person I am so close to the Lord than if I had a really smooth life and I didn't have all the losses, physical, mental, losing a dear person that I adored. And it's amazing that the older you get, it does blur out. And you focus on the Lord and not your circumstances. It, I mean, it's amazing. And you go, Lord, take it all. You are what I'm longing for. You are the greatest joy in my life. You know, I have beautiful grandkids. I have beautiful daughters. But they, they agree that the greatest love is Jesus Christ. And I think in these last days, when everything is upside down, I think we're seeing like, is the Lord the most important thing to you? You know, and I think we're here to share it because people are going, what is going on in the world? Right is wrong and wrong is right. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know. The Lord, he's the one that has to be preeminent in our lives. And the Lord's just shown me, yes, Lord, take it all. You are what I am I adore. And it, there's nothing in this life that's going to fill me up. And, I, you know, I've had some really terrific losses. But you know what? I, I take it all to knowing Jesus Christ. I mean, it's... <laughs> It's chilling how the Lord is so real in pain that he wasn't when everything was smooth. Mm. It's, 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 that's very quick. So, Lori, did, did Carol say things in a way that makes a little more sense to you than are you discussing? Are you asking me? Yes, you. I'm just wondering if, if the way she expressed that was helpful. I have moments of that, but it's definitely not all the time. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't really know how much of this is uh, because of the compound that a business was dropped into my lap besides the grief with an experience I had never run a business before. So I don't, I don't know if everything hit at one time, it was having my husband's death and having a business drop and then leaving a high demand religion of all of these things, a lot of opposition. Mm -hmm. I, so, but I have moments of strength and where I feel God is really there. And then I have moments that I, I feel very alone, too. 
we can all relate to that. I, Carolyn, I just think that that's beautiful of the the things that you've said because it isn't. I always say um, it isn't that misery likes company. It's that you that someone understands. It gave me great comfort, though. I have to tell you that I was listening to James Finley, who is a mystic with Richard Rohr, and he started a podcast. I think two weeks after his wife died, and I really thought. Gosh, if I could just be like Brother Lawrence or um, Thomas Merton, you know, but then I heard him talk about how hard he has struggled with the death of his wife. And I thought, okay, this is just a part of the journey that I'm not alone, that even mystics have a hard time with death because he talks about the devastation of the loss of his wife. He lost his wife during COVID. Mm. so there's hope for me that's what i say absolutely mm-hmm. absolutely yeah all right let's see let us not be satisfied with loving god because of the graces he has given us or may give us however great they may be these favors great though they are will never bring us as near to him as does one simple act of faith Let us seek him often by faith. He is in the midst of us. We do not need to seek him elsewhere. Are we not ill-mannered, even culpable to leave him alone while we busy ourselves with a thousand and one trivial matters which displease him and perhaps even offend him? Though he tolerates them, it is to be feared that one day they will cost us dearly. All right. So he's talking at the very beginning of that paragraph with not living or, or loving and, and living this way in order to be rewarded. If you're doing that, Jesus would say, you have your reward in full. We often said that about the Pharisees who were you know, praying on the street corners and making big spectacles of themselves and enlarging their phylacteries and the tassels so that everybody would say how holy they were. And he would say, okay, you, you got everything that you were good enough to, you know, setting out to get. But the deeper things that this prayer life is supposed to be about is still eluding you because you're not looking at it in the way that it's just your presence. So let us not be satisfied with loving God because of the graces he's giving us and made with us. The, uh, the favors themselves will never bring us as near to him as does one simple act of faith. And what is a simple act of faith? Make sure that we have our, our terms defined here. So all those favors of God, all the good times, all the ecstatic moments, all the consolations, as the ancients used to call them, will never bring us as near to God as one simple act of faith. And what's a simple act of faith? It would be stepping out and acting as if something is true, even when there's no evidence of it, and even as you doubt. You step out without any evidence that there's going to be ground underneath your foot is an act of faith. You're doing it in doubt. You're doing it in fear. You're doing it without knowing what's going to happen. Kind of just like what Carol said, you know, that the, the difficult moments and the loss that she has suffered has brought her closer to God than all the other moments. That act of faith, stepping out in unknowing is what we're talking about. Um, the the prayer of Thomas Merton, right, said, I have no idea whether I'm pleasing God or not. You know, I don't know which way I'm going. I don't know the way by I, I, I go by it. He said, but I'm going to just stick to this one piece, this one fundamental belief that my desire to please God is, in fact, pleasing to God. So whether I know whether I'm doing it or not doesn't matter anymore. My desire to please God, I know it pleases. And so the rest just works its way out. That's an act of faith. Yeah. I think I want to add to 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 Laurie and Carol in the it, it is what we feel in the depths of despair. Like, you know, Laurie, you have also said it's like one or two in the morning when you'll feel you're alone. In the good times, yeah, okay. Oh my gosh, see that beautiful flower, that's God. And that hummingbird, that's God. And I I I go there but it's in the depths of despair that's when 
And I have a hard time too, like you said too, it's that faith because I said, I don't know if you're there. At two in the morning, I'm saying, and I, I, I do, I argue with him. I said, I don't know if you're there, but if you're listening or if you are really there, come help me. And then I leave it alone. I, I don't, yeah, there's that, that doubt that mm -hmm. creeps in. And what else can I do? Just in case you're there, just in case what they say is true, just in case they say you are listening, here's my plea. Just remember, if you didn't have doubt, you couldn't have faith. Just as if you didn't have fear, you couldn't have courage. Courage is the ability to act in the presence of fear. If there's no fear, there's no courage. Faith is the ability to act in the presence of doubt. If there's no doubt, there's no faith. We crave certainty. We don't want faith. We want certainty. That's what makes us feel secure and in control. Life doesn't give us certainty. We build all these illusions of certainty, but there really isn't. There can be conviction. And that comes from knowing God, from the intimate and ongoing experience of God, comes our convictions. And they can be more powerful than certainty, if we allow. Yeah, this act of faith is important. Go ahead, I'm sorry. So, so, so is that what, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, a couple of the ladies in my Bible study, they're really like, maybe that's conviction. They say, oh, I know God told me this. I See, see, and then I, I keep quiet. I go, I, I don't know. God doesn't tell me things. Is that conviction or is that their certainty or their imagination that they want to believe what they believe? I don't understand because they speak as if, I get the impression they have no doubts at all. And so they're happier than me. <laughs> they are. I, I challenge and I I defy authority. And, I, you know, like, like I said, the example I gave you, <clears throat> I think last week it was. And I said, if God tells me, oh, I, you, you know, I kill your daughter, I will defy God. I mean, seriously, I will. That's why I love you, Ellen, though. <laughs> a fellow rebel. I love it. I will defy. And then if he says, oh, well, okay, see, you deserve to go to hell. I will accept that. Mm. But I will never, ever kill my daughter to prove to God I have faith. Mm. One thing you can take to the bank is that God is equal opportunity across the board. He doesn't play favorites or better. Everybody is God's favorite. So he doesn't talk to some people and not to others. That's not the way he rolls. You know, he is all poured out equally all the time and has been since the beginning of time. And there's no more pouring out. There's nothing that he holds back or withholds. So if someone speaks about God speaking to them, this is their subjective impression. And that's okay. That's fine. You know? We all have to become convinced of what we're convinced of, not try to replicate somebody else's conviction. It doesn't work that way. You know, so you go out and experience God in the way you do. And then when you express your experience of God, it'll be just as confusing to the person who's listening to you. <laughs> That's just the way it works. But you know, that, uh, Ellen, really? Ellen, I went through the same thing 30 years ago, oh. first hitting an evangelical church, and everybody had revelations from God every time I talked to them. And God wasn't speaking to me, so I, I felt like tough liver, right? And uh, but I, at, over the years, I realized God was speaking to me. I had to listen in a different way. I experienced it differently than these people expressed it. And I don't know that they were experiencing anything different than I was. It's just the way they expressed. It. No, no. Hmm. What what was baffling to me too? He she gave me an account of uh, she went to this church and they're speaking in tongues, and they go, "Oh yeah, see." And then somebody else will, another person will respond in speaking of tongues. And I didn't say anything, but I'm saying, but how do you know what they're saying? <laughs> like, how do you know? Like, well, if you translate it into English, I will understand. You know what? There's a, there's a big misconception about tongues. You know, tongues is our expression to God, not God's expression to us. Tongues is when the intellect is completely bypassed and we are just vocalizing. It doesn't mean anything rationally. It means everything. 
spiritually, because it's just our openness and a, a direct connection with God through a process of vocalizing. But it doesn't mean anything. You know, that's why Paul said, hey, I speak in tongues more than any of you. But if you're going to do it corporately in the middle of the group, then you got to be really careful because it can get out of hand real fast. And if any of you have ever been in a, in a Pentecostal or a charismatic church, you'll know how fast it can get out of hand and how the caste system starts to develop. It really gets screwy fast. Mm -hmm. And I said that there should be I some think, sort of... Uh, Go ahead. I think, David, forces you into presence when you're speaking in tongues you know like when i'm trying to speak another language when i'm trying to speak spanish i think part of the reason i enjoy it is that i have to be present to every word right and there's it's something else happens in that space and i think when you're speaking in tongues if you're just making random sounds it forces english out of your head and just has you know what i mean just that noise yeah. <laughs> Can I tell you guys something funny? Because I do, I don't verbalize this now, but I have some mean things to say. She was saying to, I hear God's voice <laughs> and I don't say it, but I'm saying, what do you mean? Like he talks in the King James version. He has a British accent or he has a little, uh, what? Like, mm -hmm. yeah, that, that goes in my head, right? If you hear God's voice. So I'm kind of sarcastic, but I didn't say it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you keep your sarcasm to yourself here. That's I know. I, can't I don't want to make enemies of them. They, they're good, supportive women that uh, help. That's why I, I love. I love Brady's formulation from his near death experience, where he he kept saying over and over, "I was made to know that," and so that implies that it wasn't actually words that were being spoken but something was being communicated in a way that he was made to know something. I think that's as close as we can probably get in, in language to describe. I mean, I can tell you that, that when I had my breakthrough and I finally understood this thing about love that I'd been banging away at for 10 years at the time, you know, I can say that I, I understood the words. If God's love is perfect, then God can't love me anymore and God can't love me any less. And there's nothing I can do to make God love me anymore or any less. And it's like that idea came to me. I didn't hear a voice and I didn't see words, but I understood that. And that's the way I express it. But I was made to know that. There was just this breakthrough into that. But it wasn't a voice that was speaking to me. So, William, but, I think you should do a, a, an extra addendum on each number of the Enneagram and how they receive God. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'd like to know where I am. Yeah. Dave shakes his head. It's like, <laughs> yeah, all the people that are here in tongues, who knows? <laughs> yeah, will you write a book? I'm, I'm yes, working. I'm I'll working. give you a good review <laughs> on <laughs> Amazon. <laughs> analyze, analyze so, us. So basically, the Enneagram is is a uh, it's we about lost, how we lose our way from God. It's the nine different ways we separate ourselves from God, essentially. Yeah. This conversation reminds me of a story, and I'll try and make it really quick. This fellow was um, navigating a mountaintop, an, an icy mountaintop, and it was really foggy, and he couldn't see. And he stopped, and the fog cleared, and he was two steps away from the edge. And if you would have taken one more step forward, he would have fallen off. And he heard a voice that said, uh, step off and I'll catch you and hold you. And he said, is there anybody else there? <laughs> At first he called on God and then he heard the voice. And then he, 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 he wanted a different voice. <laughs> Sorry, I massacred the story, but I think you get that. No, you did great. Got it. All right. So God is in the midst of us. We don't need to seek him elsewhere. We don't need to go to some place. We don't need to go to Tibet or Jerusalem. God is right here. And he can't be any more present than he is right here. Are we not then, he says, then, are we not ill-mannered, even culpable to leave him alone while we busy ourselves with a thousand and one trivial matters? 
So if God is right here, right now, it's like having a house guest over and you don't pay any attention to him. That's basically the image that Brother Lawrence is bringing up here. And that just pleases him, he says, and perhaps even offends him. I don't know if God is offendable. I wouldn't put it that way, but I get what he's saying. Though he tolerates these mind wanderings, right? It is to be feared that one day they will cost us dearly. And I would say not by retaliation by God, but by our own unawareness. If it's going to cost us, it's because we're walking past God and we're reinforcing our ability to walk right past God's presence. Not that God would ever retaliate. And then he finally ends with, let us begin to be devoted to him in earnest, banishing from our hearts and minds all else. He wishes to be there alone. Let us ask this grace of him. If on our part we do the best we can, we will soon see in ourselves the changes we are hoping for. I cannot thank him enough for the little relief he has given you. I hope through his mercy the grace of seeing him in a few days. Let us pray for one another. I am in our Lord yours. And six days later, he was dead. I do like this. Um, let us begin to be devoted to him in earnest, banishing from our hearts and minds all else. God wishes to be there alone. He wishes to be in that intimate. And, and I think Carol said, or somebody said, preeminent spot. We will soon see our, in ourselves the changes that we are hoping for. It's so interesting that the change that we work for contemplatively isn't something that we're aware of as it's happening. It's just, and in fact, if we are focused on the change, then we're not really present anymore, are we? We're focused on the future. We're focused on something that stands outside the moment. And so just by being immersed in the process and not thinking about the change, not thinking about the outcome, that's when the change is actually taking place. And then we will see it retroactively, or someone will see it and comment to us. But let us ask this grace of him, if on our part we do the best we can, we will soon see in ourselves the changes we are hoping for. They will come as the byproduct. I cannot thank him enough for the little relief he has given you. Remember in the previous letter, um, she had finally started to feel better. Uh, in the illness that she was suffering for so long. I hope through his mercy, the grace of seeing him in a few days. Interesting. Let us pray for one another. I am in our Lord. And that's it. We did it, except for the spiritual maxims. But I think if you even just kind of, you know, scan through the spiritual maxims, it will be very familiar to you. And you will realize that, uh, once again, there's, there's nothing in those spiritual maxims that we haven't already covered in the letters and the conversations. So you're not missing anything. All right. In the couple last minutes we've got, any overall impressions or comments about Brother Lawrence? I like the fact that he indicated he was, a, he was a, not a learned man. Uh, and yet his devotion in, in his daily activities, um, was, was in his practice and, um, not just in prayer, as he had said earlier in the book, but be in prayer, be the prayer. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I made that clear or not, but, uh, and I think he just said it back here too on this last page. When he said that, um, says, let us not be satisfied with loving God because of the graces he has given or may give us, however great they may be. But these favors, great though they are, will never bring us as near to him as one does, as does one simple act of faith. I, mean, I love that. I think that's, I, I, that's poetic. What can I say? I think that's just beautiful. Mm -hmm. And, um, <laughs> The acceptance with which uh, he is he is comporting himself in his last sentence. You know, I can't thank him enough for the little relief he has given you. I hope through his mercy, the grace of seeing him in a few days, let us pray for one another. I think he knew that that uh, the time was time was coming up. Mm -hmm. And uh, then here on the translator's note that 
six days later is when he when he uh, he was granted his wish. Hmm. I think that's uh, <laughs> in some. I I just I I I I think brother. I think it's a beautiful um, illustration of the devoted person brother Lawrence was in all his thoughts and deeds. I mean, you know, you can. You can live the life of a monk, and I mean, I understand all that sort of thing, and you know, the living in an abbey and that sort of thing, and and um, being in being in constant prayer and all that sort of thing. But constant prayer also means washing the dishes. Mm -hmm. I like that. So, enough out of me. I got to go wash dishes. As a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think he's a sweet, dear man that if I'm sitting next to him and I say something, you know, like snotty, he'll forgive me. <laughs> right? And he'll say, well, you could probably even be sarcastic with a melon and he would still like you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and he'll remind me of humility. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Can I say something funny? Actually, I read this somewhere. There was a tourist who went to the Wailing Wall. And so there was this old Jewish man crying, beating his chest, talking to God at the Wailing Wall. And then the tourist asked, so you're praying? He goes, yes. So is it effective? And the, the old Jewish man, the very devout Jewish man says, no, it's like talking to a wall. Who found that so funny? <laughs> I found that so funny. <laughs> oh, what do we do without you, Ellen? <laughs> you, you can't stop coming back. You just can't. Oh, there's That was mm. funny. <laughs> All right. Any other final thoughts before we close the book? Uh. Mm. All right, we did it. Yeah. You are the 12. You are the ones, the, the bitter enders, the few, the proud. So thank you for sticking with it for all 36 or 37 weeks, whatever it was. Um, but uh, this has been a great study. I know we've done this before, but it's been a few years. And um, this is the, the my best experience going through this book. This, this is a really mm. good um, set of discussions that we've had. And mm -hmm. so thank you for that. Thank you for the, the penetrating questions. Thank you for the opposition. Thank you for playing devil's advocate and all the things because that gave us the ability to grind on some of these things and get some of these other points. That's what it really comes along. Mm -hmm. So next week when we get into just this, it's going to be a very different, a completely different um, tone and and, uh, and just uh, thought process as we go through this. I mean, from, you know, 300 years ago to today, uh, Richard Rohr, the way he thinks. But even th the tone of this book is very different than the tone of Falling Upward. So I think you'll notice that right away. It's got more of a kind of a memoir feel to it, um, you know, because it's just his thoughts and meditations on the contemporary process. So I think it'll be a good follow-on. The current game, I'm just looking at the book myself. So it's, oh, well, this says copyright 2017, so it's fairly current, fairly recent. Fairly current, yeah. It, it's one of his most recent books. Mm. Anybody not have the book yet? That, that's funny, I'm What is it called? What, what is it called? It's called Just This. Oh. Um, yeah, if, if you don't, uh, I do have a PDF version um, that I can email you that has it's the same page numbers and everything you can follow through with that until you get your hard copy in case it hasn't arrived yet. But. And then I can pay you back, right? Um, you won't have to pay me back for the PDF version. Oh, okay. But you can also just listen, Linda. You don't need a book. We're always going to read to it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Then we are done. Thanks, everybody, again. And uh, we'll see you all on Sunday. Scotty. Hi, God. Thanks for being with us through the study and sharing and questioning and trying to figure out what's what and what's the best way to conduct ourselves in our day-to-day -day lives. And it seems, if anything, we've pointed out that 
just being aware of your presence continually can change everything and change it for the better. So, Lord, I just pray for our individual relationships with each other and with you. We thank you that you bless us and love us and care for us. We give our thanks, we pray our prayers, and we ask all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Okay. I'm going to go put this in the bookshelf. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> it's going to rest there until next time. Good night, mm -hmm. everybody. See you Sunday. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, Carol. Good night, Gail. Yes. Good night. Good night. It's so quiet tonight. Well, I'm um, kind of coming in on the tail end. I I came because I thought we were starting the next book, and I couldn't find the book. And um, I texted Bill, and he said it's in my backpack or whatever. And I picked it up, and it was this book for tonight. Okay. Well, we'll just sit now you this. know next week for sure is the yeah is the new book. So yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Good, Good to night, see Gail, you. Jordana, Linda. See you guys. Good night. Yeah, you guys on Sunday. All righty. Bye-bye.